Hello everyone. Uh, my name is Spencer Allingham and I'm the Regional Vice President at Conducive for the Europe, Middle East and Africa region. Um, now, first of all, I have to start with an apology. I gave this presentation earlier and because I'm an idiot, I forgot to hit the record button and I promised everybody a recording of the session. So I'm re-recording the content now um, and I hope you all forgive me for that. Um, now, Yes, I'm the regional VP, and what I don't want you to do is think, oh, no, it's a sales guy or it's a marketing guy. <laughs> Before I recently got promoted, I was actually the technical director at Conducive for about seven years, in fact. Um, and uh, so I wanted to keep this fairly technical. I, I hope that's OK, um, and uh, I hope you won't get put off by the, by the title. Um, I did mention at this point as well, uh, that if you had any questions uh, as we went through, uh, to put them in the Q&A box, which some of you did, which is brilliant, and I will answer those questions again at the end of this session um, so that you, you have them all recorded. Now, the first slide really is to try and um, explain why you might want to try the Velocity software. Um, in, in your environments, with your real-world workloads, with your real-world hardware, with your real SQL servers. Um, I ran a series of lab tests with and without the Velocity software using HammerDB to generate a workload, which a lot of you SQL DBAs will likely be familiar with and have probably used yourself. Um, I was able to see that the transactions, that the SQL transactions per minute increased when our Velocity software was present by about 30%. So that's 30% more SQL transactions, 30% more productive when using these, or when running these tests using very fast NVMe connected flash storage. So that's already very, very fast for, for SQL servers. And some of you are already using this. I know not everybody is yet, but it's super, super fast. But even so, I was able to get 30% more transactions done in the same amount of time. And for HammerDB, which have uh, virtual warehouses and a virtual shop with virtual users placing virtual orders. It meant that they were able to get about 28% more orders processed every minute, which is very, very good. And to back up these figures, I also used Windows Performance Monitor to measure the number of SQL transactions per second. And I saw that increase by about 28% as well. So, the only difference is the Velocity software was installed. It's a software only approach. Um, and I was able to get significantly more productivity out of this SQL environment just by having the Velocity software there. I then ran the same battery of tests again in exactly the same way, but this time using slower spinning disk hard drive storage. And the results were even more dramatic. There was about a hundred percent improvement in productivity. So this is why you might want to consider trying the Velocity software for yourselves. If you care about the performance of your SQL and other types of database workloads, it's a very quick, easy, inexpensive way to improve the productivity without the need for additional hardware. Just simply download this software utility, install it. Um, it's not disruptive in any way. You don't have to make any SQL code changes. You don't have to reboot anything. Your SQL servers will stay online and within minutes, you'll start seeing results like this. So as I mentioned, Velocity software only solution, its purpose is to allow Windows environments that are hosting things like SQL, Oracle, MariaDB, other workloads like business information systems like IBM Cognos, ERP environments, document management systems, busy file servers, all of them to be able to process a greater amount of workload in the same amount of time without the need for additional hardware. We'll basically just tune the workloads that you're running on the hardware that you already own so that you can do more with them. Um, now, we've got a number of industry accreditations, which is fantastic. Um, I do like the, the Gartner Call Vendor Badge that we were given a few years ago. Um, and this was really 
a little time after we introduced the Velocity software, Gartner said that really people should consider including this type of technology with every virtualization in initiative to reduce the amount of storage IO traffic that actually has to go out and be processed by the disk storage layer. And because of the RAM caching technology that's in it, and because of the performance improvements and workload capacity improvements that those provide, which is very cool, um, especially when you consider that as a software company, we've been around since 1981. Um, so yeah, we've been around a long time for a software company. We're kind of a, a granddaddy of software companies. So, so to achieve a, a cool vendor badge from someone like Gartner is brilliant. <laughs> um, but what I really wanted to draw your attention to was this Microsoft SQL Server IO reliability certification. Basically, our engineers got together with some Microsoft engineers and ran a series of tests using Microsoft's Azure platform um, with SQL 2016. And we were able to prove that our software does not adversely or negatively affect the characteristics that a storage IO subsystem has to provide for SQL Server as defined by Microsoft themselves. Now, in addition to being able to jump through those hoops, we were also able to, in the testing, show that we could uh, provide roughly 30% more SQL transactions in the same amount of time as well, which was really the cherry on the top. So very, very pleasing results. But the point is, it's certified for use in SQL environments by Microsoft themselves. Now, let's talk a little bit about the inefficiencies and the problems that this software resolves in order to provide you those performance boosts for SQL and other types of databases. The very first thing that the software will provide right out of the box is very intelligent RAM caching right inside these Windows operating systems themselves um, using only otherwise idle RAM so that the more of that read IO traffic you can satisfy at the speed of RAM rather than the speed of the media down here in the back end disk storage, well, that's got to be a good thing for performance. And these performance improvements are in addition to the caching or buffering that SQL provides by itself natively, and in addition to other types of caching that you find natively inside the Windows operating system. We're not saying turn those off in any way. The benefits we provide are in addition to whatever's already going on. So that already helps. It reduces the amount of storage IO traffic that has to be go out and be processed by the backend disk layer and improves the performance of those read IO requests by satisfying it from very fast RAM rather than slower disk storage. And to give you an idea, um, yes, it, it depends on the size of storage IO packets and a few other factors as well. But as a general rule, satisfying reads from RAM is roughly 10 times faster than satisfying it from flash and SSD storage. And it's significantly faster than satisfying it from spinning disk technologies like SAS drives, SATA drives, or SCSI drives. So very, very helpful, very, very good performance improvement right there. But that's only half of the story. There is an often overlooked inefficiency in the Windows operating system itself, and it has to do with the way that Windows interfaces with the storage. Now, what happens basically is, as the NTFS file systems that you have mounted in these Windows machines, and by the way, they don't have to be virtual machines. The same applies to physical Windows servers and even laptops and workstations. What happens is, as you use these NTFS volumes that you've got mounted over time, they mature as you are creating new files, extending files, shrinking files, deleting files, and generally moving data around on those NTFS volumes, what happens is the free space will become more and more split up into smaller and smaller free space extents. And that's the reason why most SQL DBAs, when they're formatting a new volume to be used by SQL, 
they will actually format it with a 64K cluster size rather than accepting the NTFS default of just 4K. It helps to prevent a lot of these split IO situations that we're talking about. So it doesn't actually fix the problem though, whereas our software goes a lot further to uh, fixing it as I'll, I'll try and explain. So you've got a situation where the free space becomes more and more split up over time. So now the Windows write driver is being given a right to perform by SQL or by the Windows OS or by something else. What it does is it goes to something in the operating system called the Windows free space cache. And it says, hey, free space cache, where's my next available free space? I have a right to perform. The free space cache then gives it that address to start writing to. It starts writing out the data and then finds, ah, wait, that free space isn't big enough to write all of this data. So I'm going to split the right I.O. I'll send the data I have been able to write so far on down to the storage in an I.O. packet. I'll go back to the Windows free space cache and find another free space and I'll continue writing there. So it does that. And then it finds again, oh, there's still not enough room. So I'm going to have to split the I.O. again, go back to the Windows free space cache again, and basically repeat and repeat and repeat until it's been able to complete that right I.O. operation that it's been tasked with. That's very inefficient. Each I.O. that has to be generated takes a measurable amount of time and resource to process. And in the real world, what that means is an average gigabyte of storage I.O. traffic that should take maybe 2,000 I.O.s to complete is now taking 30,000 or 40,000 or even more I.O.s to complete. Far, far less efficient. What you want is a situation like this where you have far fewer I.O. packets moving between server and storage, but each I.O. packet is carrying a much larger payload of data. What it means is that when that storage traffic arrives down at the storage controller down here at the bottom of the stack, it's arriving in much larger chunks at a time. It gives the storage controller the, uh, the opportunity to create larger, more sequential stripes across its media using far fewer storage level operations. That's a lot more efficient. Um, and it's also more efficient if that data needs to be read later on down the line as well. So this is really not a great situation to have. The performance penalty that gets caused by these small fractured split IOs, we call the Windows IO tax, as in a tax on your performance because of this inefficiency in Windows. Now, if you're running SQL or other workloads in a virtualized environment like we have here on the screen, that performance penalty that you get from the split IOs can be amplified and made worse by something called the IO blender effect. And what's happening here is you have the small fractured IO packets coming out of a number of virtual machines. They're all being funneled down through the physical host hypervisor and the hypervisor acts like a blender and it mixes all of these IO packets together so that what then comes out between the physical host and the storage controller is really a chaotic mess of small, fractured and now very randomized IO streams that by the time they hit the storage controller down here, they couldn't be less storage friendly. The storage controller doesn't understand the relationships between the packets that it's receiving, so it's only being given the opportunity to create very small stripes across its media. And of course, that means so many more storage level operations are required to process any given gigabyte of storage traffic. So this is super inefficient. This is a bit like saying, OK, imagine a, a busy motorway at rush hour. Um, you've got lots and lots of cars as far as the eye can see and um, it's all one big traffic jam and no one's moving anywhere very fast because it's all very congested. Now imagine that each car is an IO packet and each person inside each car is your data. What we're effectively doing with the Velocity software is taking all of the people out of the cars and putting them into coaches and buses 
and removing all of those cars off of the motorway and getting rid of all of that congestion so that now the people or your data can now flow to where it needs to get to in a much more efficient manner. And it does this by inserting a very thin storage filter driver into the Windows storage stack to give it an extra layer of intelligence so that it can make better choices about where to write on those NTFS volumes in order to avoid having to split that data up when it's writing it. So it can help it find a large enough area of free space to put that data into without having to split it up. And of course, the software will quietly, automatically, in the background, using only idle um, compute resources, help to create those nice large areas of free space as well to make it easier for the Windows write driver to write into. So I hope that makes sense. Um, you know, the Having this type of situation is a bit like saying, OK, on this side of the room, I have a litre of water, which is my data, and I need to move it to this side of the room, which is where the storage is. Of course, it's a lot more efficient to make one trip across the room with a litre sized jug than it is to take that same amount of water and pour it into lots of tiny shot glasses and then take the first two shot glasses across the room and then come back and take the next two shot glasses across the room. And then come back and take the next two shots. You see how these small shot glass sized IOs make this whole infrastructure work so much harder than it should to process any given gigabyte of storage IO traffic. What you really want is this type of situation where you're reducing as much of that workload on the back end storage as you can and providing as much performance to the workloads, including SQL, that are running in these Windows machines. So I hope that makes sense. Now, there's a few uh, best practice uh, helpful hints that I can provide you, which are specific to SQL. The first one is, if at all possible, add a bit more RAM to those machines that are running SQL Server. As you know, as DBAs, SQL can be not so much memory hungry as, as memory addicted. <laughs> um, so I would say for best results, if you've got an important busy SQL server, try and leave 16 gigabytes of RAM in that machine that isn't being used by SQL or the Windows operating system or anything else. Leave 16 gig of free RAM. The Velocity software will be able to use some of that free RAM um, to generate a RAM cache. And the bigger the RAM cache, the better the results are going to be because the more of that read traffic we can satisfy from RAM rather than it all having to go out to the back end storage. If you can't afford 16 gigabytes, then leave eight gigabytes free. If you can't afford eight gigabytes, leave four gigabytes free. Even that is enough to make a difference. If you go much smaller than four gigabytes free, then really you're going to be limiting the cache size a bit too much and results would be limited. But hopefully that gives you an idea uh, of, of, of sort of how to size the RAM. Um, the RAM cache that Velocity creates is dynamically sized, so it can grow and shrink automatically depending on the resource requirements of everything else that's running in the machine, including SQL. We'll even shrink our RAM cache down to zero and still leave at least one and a half gigabytes of memory free at all times, um, really so that we can never be the cause of a memory starvation situation. Um, but where you have some RAM free, we can put it to very good use for that RAM caching. And that leads me on to the next best practice tip. And that is most people consider it best practice. Most DBAs will cap the amount of memory that SQL can take for itself. If you don't, SQL will continue typically to chew through all of the available memory pretty much and leave only a small amount free, not enough for us to cache with. So if you cap the amount of memory that SQL can take for itself, you'll probably leave enough memory free for our, us to cache with. If you want to add some additional memory to a machine, again, cap SQL so that when you bring the system back online, SQL doesn't say, ah, there's more memory there and steal it for itself. Our software has been intentionally designed not to be able to compete for RAM and other resources 
with anything else that's running. So if SQL grabs that RAM for itself, we wouldn't get a chance to use it. But if you cap the amount of RAM that SQL can take for itself and force it to leave enough RAM free for us to cache with, you will have very, very good results. Um, the next step is to monitor the velocity dashboard. We've got uh, very transparent reporting, um, which you'll see in just a second. And, and basically, if you're offloading less than 40 or 50 percent of all of that read IO traffic, then Simply give it a bit more RAM, give it a larger cache size, and you'll get even better results. This is an example of the type of reporting that you can see in the Velocity software. Um, as I mentioned, we've tried to make it as transparent as we possibly can to really show what benefit the software is providing. Um, so that you don't just have to rely on things like measuring how many more SQL transactions you were able to do per hour or per day, or were batch jobs completing more quickly, were reports taking less time to produce. We actually want to show you really the nuts and bolts of what the software is able to achieve. So we can show you exactly how many storage IOs we were able to eliminate. So without our software, all of this nine and a half million storage IO traffic, in addition to the rest of the traffic, would have had to have gone out and be dealt with by the back end storage. So that's a good amount of IO reduction. We can show you what percentage of the reads are not having to go out to the back end storage and what percentage of the writes and how much storage time is being saved. So this is basically calculated on the number of IOs we were able to eliminate from having to go out to the storage multiplied by the average IO response time at the time these IOs were generated. So the more storage time you free up, the more you free up for the storage to be able to process additional workloads. So that might be that you have a, a workload, it might be SQL, or might be something else that's really only running as fast as the storage will allow it to. It's what we call storage bound. Well now, that workload can become more productive. It can get more work done in the same amount of time, quite simply because it's not having to wait so much on the storage before being able to get on with its next operation or transaction. And this storage IO or IOPS headroom that we're handing back to the environment is itself very valuable because it means that you can now host a greater number of workloads, a greater number of SQL servers, a greater number of machines, a greater number of users using and manipulating the data and creating this IO traffic than you otherwise would be able to do. And that really helps the return on the investment that you've made in that expensive backend storage. You can now use it to do more because each workload is being reduced by 30 to 50 percent in terms of the IO that it's producing for the storage to deal with. So I hope that makes sense. A uh, couple of other best practice tips. Um, this is really if you're using um, SQL or other workloads in a in a virtualized environment. If you're using thin provisioned storage, so some people are using things like thin provisioned VMDK files or th uh, uh, dynamic disks in um, Microsoft, excuse me, Microsoft Hyper V. This is where you create a volume and you tell it that it's going to be this size, but actually it only takes up in reality this amount of size. And as you write to it, it grows and allocates blocks. Now, after a while, that thin provision volume, even though it started out small as you write more and more data to it, it will grow and it will start to bloat in size. And even if you delete data from that thin provision volume, it doesn't automatically shrink back down. So in order to reclaim that space, typically what people do is run something like sdelete, um, which will zero out what Windows sees as free space. And then you can um, do a storage migration and move that VMDK file from one data store to another and say, I want the, the target VMDK file to be thin again. And what it will do is copy across the blocks that have data in, but any blocks that have zeros in will get left behind. So your thin provisioned volume actually becomes thin again. The problem with that process, especially if you're using larger volumes, is running sdelete can take hours. 
literally hours to run before you've even got to the point where you can actually start to reclaim space. With the Velocity software, it can quietly and automatically do that zeroing out for you in the background so that when you need to reclaim space, just do the storage migration. That zeroing out's already done um, and you can get on with your day much more quickly. Similarly, if you're using thin provisioning down at the storage layer, uh, we can help there too. A lot of today's storage uses thin provisioning. Uh, things like HP 3PAR SANS or um, Dell Compellent Storage, NetApp Filers, they will use thin provisioning down inside their storage layer as well. And we can send SCSI unmap commands down to the storage controller and say, hey, storage, these, these blocks, they're no longer needed. You can add them back to the available pool. Very convenient way of, of reclaiming storage on the fly. And it also works with VVOLs or virtual volumes in VMware. So if you're using that type of software defined storage, that also can understand and accept SCSI unmap commands. So it, it works perfectly with that as well. Um, thin provisioned memory. Um, if you're using thick provision memory, which is a fixed amount of memory assigned to each virtual machine, then you're fine. You don't need to listen to this bit. But if you're using dynamically allocated memory in such a way that the host hypervisor can steal some memory back from a Windows VM and reallocate it to some other VM that needs it, that means that we might not get enough RAM to cache with. So for best results in that virtual machine's configuration, make sure you reserve enough RAM for that machine for the Windows OS, for SQL Server, and for velocity to cache with, and you will get very good results from that. Um, and it basically stops the uh, hypervisor from stealing too much RAM and, and reallocating it elsewhere. As I said, if you're using um, a fixed amount of memory on your SQL VMs, which I think most people do because SQL databases tend to be quite important, you don't need to worry about that. We have a lot of very good case studies on our website at conducive.com. So if ever you want a bit of light bedtime reading, uh, pop across there and, uh, and download some of these. Now, I said at the beginning, I'm an engineer, really, at heart, not a, a sales and marketing guy. So I won't give you death by PowerPoint by reading all of these. But I'll, I'll pick out a couple of examples, which I think are, are pretty cool. Um, firstly, down here on the bottom left, we have Bell Mobility. Our Velocity software reduced the storage I.O. traffic going out to their SAN by 61%. That was a huge storage workload reduction. And it basically meant that their SQL report queries were three times faster. No additional hardware required. All they had to do was install our software on their existing platform. And within minutes, they started seeing these types of savings. Um, and as I mentioned before, it's not disruptive. You don't have to reboot anything. You don't have to make any SQL code changes. Just install the software. If it's not right for you, just install the software. You're not going to affect the live running workloads, especially SQL, uh, in any way other than to improve their performance. Um, ASL Marketing here in the center, their SQL batch imports were huge. They were taking 27 hours we were able to drop them to just 12 hours, a significant reduction, um, making them a lot more productive. Again, no additional hardware required. And the last one that I really like is this one on the top left, Christus Health. They're a, a healthcare organization in North America, quite a large one. Um, and they had virtualized their medical records application. So it was running on physical Windows servers and it was now running in VMware. And they were suffering so badly from the, the, the small split I.O. Um, performance tax and the I.O. Blender effect that it was really bringing the performance of these systems to its knees. And as a result, they were going to do what a lot of IT professionals have been trained to do over the years, which is they were going to rip and replace their SAN storage with a much larger, much faster SAN. Um, and really overbuy and over provision the storage to cope with all of this, frankly, unnecessary storage workload. But they tried our Velocity software first 
And we were able to give them back so much more performance that they actually cancelled the $2 million purchase order for the new storage hardware. Now, <laughs> as you can imagine, the storage hardware manufacturer was cross, to say the least. In fact, <laughs> the, 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 the sales guy from that company came and found us at one of the uh, VMworlds over in Vegas. And yeah, he was he was pretty cross because um, of course he he saw his commission go away <laughs> um, which I know I, I shouldn't laugh at that but there is a, a positive and, and kind outcome for him as well um, so it turns out that they are still going to purchase that replacement storage from that storage company and the guy will still get his commission but they were able to defer that capital investment actually for a number of years so rather than having to find $2 million to purchase this storage hardware solution as a break fix solution right now that hadn't been budgeted for, we were able to give them back all that performance they needed so that they can buy that storage in a, in a year or two and budget for it properly. And by the way, a lot of people find that when they do use our software to reduce the IO workload, when they come to the point where they actually need to refresh the hardware, which can often now take longer, they probably don't need to overbuy and over-provision the storage hardware quite as much because on average, customers see an IO reduction of somewhere between 30 to 50%. That's a customer average. So if you're sending 30 to 50% less storage traffic down for the back-end storage to deal with, your next send maybe doesn't need to be quite as expensive as you had feared. Um, anyway, all of these are available for, for download and consumption at conducive.com. Um, in terms of next steps, everybody that um, attended and is going to receive a single full free copy of the Velocity software that's worth about $500. Um, that's our gift to you. That's yours to keep. It doesn't expire. It's the full software. This is really helpful if you've got a, a particular server uh, or a particular SQL workload that you want to put that on, provide uh, performance improvement to, and really see how the software works, see how easy it is to use, see how easy it is to install and uninstall, and really see what difference it makes. But as an engineer, I'm going to give you a, a, a handy tip. If you want to see the full power of the Velocity software, don't just put it onto one machine. Grab a copy of the 30-day trialware, which is also free and provided with no obligation to purchase. Um, you can get it from that link at the bottom there, conducive.com slash try. Put that onto all of the Windows machines that are sharing the same backend storage, or as many of them as you can. Um, the reason for that is... Yes, it's beneficial to reduce the storage workload coming out of one machine by 30 to 50 percent, but it's a far more dramatic improvement to reduce all of the storage workload by 30 to 50 percent from all of the Windows machines that are sharing the back end storage. That's just logical, right? Um, so if you really want to do a, a full proof of concept, that's how I would recommend you test it. Get the trial wet and install it onto as many machines as you can. And that's how you're going to get the most bang for buck. Um, and of course, we're very, um, very pleased to help you uh, download, install, get it set up. It literally takes minutes. It's very easy to do. Um, we can help you deploy the software across the network again with no reboots and no disruption. We can help you run that proof of concept test. We can help you interpret the results and uh, provide a written engineer's report based on that dashboard report data, if that would be helpful to you. Feel free to, to get in touch and use us for that. Similarly, if you have any questions after the event, you're very welcome to reach out. There's um, contact details here on the screen that for North America. Uh, there's a, an email address of one of my colleagues out there who's extremely knowledgeable and a, a phone number for him. My details are here, uh, SRSE EMEA. Uh, that email address will come directly through to me personally. Um, you can also call on, on this number. Um, 
see if it works for you. See, see just how much performance gain you can get just by installing this simple software utility. Um, now, I don't want you really to take my word for any of this. I would much rather you try it for yourself in your real world environments, with your real world hardware, with your real world workloads and your real world SQL servers. See what it can actually do for you. Don't take my word for any of it. Um, so I hope that helps. I know that um, there were... Uh, several questions in the uh, session earlier on. So I'm just going to bring those up and answer those as well so that they're, they're recorded. So uh, Jignes said, can Velocity help performance improvement of SQL on physical servers? And I know the examples I gave in this presentation really were tailored more to virtualized environment. Uh, of environments, sorry. <laughs> but yes, the software works very, very well on physical Windows servers, especially those running SQL, Oracle, and other database types as well. Um, you know, the, In fact, most physical environments tend to work best straight out of the box because they tend to have more RAM in them, especially RAM that's free that we can use for caching with. Virtual machines tend to be a little bit more restrictive on the amount of RAM that's provisioned to them. So for best results, sometimes you need to increase the RAM on those virtual machines. So yes, it works very, very well with physical Windows servers. Um, and Jignes said again, I was going through your other product lines and found that you have the Disk Keeper product as well for physical server. So which one is better, Velocity or Disk Keeper? Now, a little secret here. Velocity and Disk Keeper are basically doing the same job, and it doesn't really matter which one you choose. They both have the same, a lot of the same underlying code base. They have the same feature set. They have a lot of the same underlying technology. So why do we have both products? The answer to that is that it's more of a marketing distinction. A lot of people in the IT industry remember the Disk Keeper brand over our 30-year heritage as being for physical servers, whether you know, back in the early 80s and 90s, it was for uh, VAX VMS systems by um, Digital Equipment Corporation or DEC. Probably most of you are far too young to remember those. Um, unfortunately, I'm not. <laughs> but then from the mid 90s, when Microsoft bought out Windows NT4, um, Disk Keeper was really the go-to solution for disk fragmentation and, and doing defrags. And in fact, what a lot of people don't know is that the built-in Windows Disk Defragmenter is based on our old Disk Keeper technology from the mid-90s when Windows NT4 became a thing. Um, and the move file API that's still in Windows today that controls all of the movement of data around a, an NTFS volume. Well, actually, our engineers co-developed that with Microsoft. Um, so you know, we've got a, a good lineage and a good heritage with the Disk Keeper uh, software and the Disk Keeper brand. But even today, a lot of people still remember it as being a disk defrag solution. Now, hopefully from the session today, you will have realized that that's not where Disk Keeper is today. We've evolved the product a long way away from just being simple disk defrag. Now it's a lot more about I.O. reduction, performance improvements, and reducing that I.O. workload on the back-end storage. And Velocity, as a brand, is doing exactly the same thing, but it's marketed to virtualized environments. Because when, we, when virtualized environments started becoming popular, probably six, seven years ago, um, people would look at the Disk Keeper software and say, yeah, that's for physical machines. That's for physical servers. It's not for virtual machines. Um, and they didn't, it was difficult for a lot of people to move away from it being just a simple defrag tool. So we brought out the Velocity brand for virtual environments. But here's the thing. It, you can run Disk Keeper in virtual machines and get the same results. You can run the Velocity software on virtual and physical machines if you want to and get the same types of performance improvements. So it's really up to you. Um, you, know, you, can, you can run either in either environment. 
And for a lot of customers that have a mixed environment where they've got some physical machines, maybe physical servers, even workstations and laptops, and a, and a, a virtualized estate, maybe they're running VMware or, or Hyper-V, or maybe they're even running workloads in Windows in a cloud environment, use the Velocity software and you can have a central point of command and control, a velocity management console that you can use to easily deploy the software across the network to, to the machines, use it as a single point for reporting, alerting, licensing. It makes it very, very convenient, whether the machines are physical, virtual, running in the cloud, whatever they are. So I hope that answers that question. Um, uh, let's see. Oh, in fact, Jignes did say that's good. Thanks for the explanation. Good. <laughs> um, then I had another question from Alexei Sidorenko. I hope I pronounced that correctly. He said, what's the difference between the free copy worth $500 and the free trial? So the, the, the free full copy that's got a, a $500 value, that is a full copy of the software. That, that's the same software that we sell to customers. That's a full free copy that's yours to keep. That's our gift to you to say thank you for giving us the time um, and the interest in, in, uh, in this session. Um, the 30-day trial where, again, you can download it for free with no obligation to purchase using that URL at the bottom, conducive.com slash try. You can install that instead of just on one machine to as many machines as you want to. And I would urge you to do that if you're serious about testing this properly. Um, that will run fully featured for a 30 day period. And when those 30 days are up, the software will become inactive and all of the workloads that you're running, including the SQL ones, will go back to how they were working and go back to that performance level that you had before you introduced the Velocity software. If you decided then that you wanted to go on and purchase the Velocity software, well, we could then just simply provide you with a license file, which you could then use to change that, all those installations of the Velocity trial where into the full version. So there's no uninstalling and reinstalling required. You just apply the license file and those trialware installations become the full version. It's as simple as that. Um, so I, I hope that explains that properly. Um, and then uh, Zane Duma said, how does the pricing work on SQL clusters? Now, there's several different ways of licensing the software. The most popular, certainly in virtualized environments, is to purchase host-based licensing. Now, this is usually most popular if you're running more than 10 machines in a, a physical host hypervisor. So if you've got a VMware ESXi server and it's hosting more than 10 VMs, that's typically your cheapest way of, of using the software. It means that all of the VMs are entitled to have the Velocity software installed on them and any additional VMs that you create further down the road, they're also licensed and covered to have the Velocity software installed. If you're running fewer than 10 VMs on a physical host, or if you're running physical servers, you can buy a per machine license. So let's say you had six virtual machines or six physical servers. Well, buy six uh, licenses. They cost about $500 uh, dollars each um, for each server. Um, and we also offer quantity discounts. So if you wanted to buy a larger number of licenses, whether they're host licenses or single server licenses or single machine licenses, even for workstations and laptops, the more you purchase, the bigger the discount we can provide for you. Um, and the way to, to get that is to either reach out to your favorite software reseller and request a quotation from them. We work with thousands of channel partners all over the world um, and your quotation would go out oh, your quotation request would go to them and we would then work with them to make sure that we provide them and you with the cheapest way to purchase the software that's tailored for your specific environment alternatively if you don't have a preferred reseller or a preferred channel partner you can contact us directly use these contact details here 
we can get you in touch with the right person. We've got ladies and gentlemen whose job it is to have a brief discussion to discover what type of environment you have and based on that to provide you with the very best price for what you need to run it for your workloads in your environment. So feel free to reach out to us and, and get those quotations. Um, there is also another way of consuming the software, which is based on physical CPU cores. Um, and obviously, the, the more cores you license, the, the, the more the software costs. That tends to be less popular these days because Windows servers are becoming more and more powerful and have more and more CPU cores in them. So nowadays, it actually works out a lot cheaper in most cases to, to get a host-based license than it is to license those CPU cores or buy a per-server license. But that option is still available if you think it would be helpful, but um, typically it's going to be host or, or per-machine based uh, to give you the best price. Um, oh, I should mention as well, we also, in addition to the quantity discounts, we also offer discounts for government and academic virtual. So if you're a school or a university, we can give you additional discounts. If you're a government organization, again, we can offer you additional discounts as well. So let us know what type of environment you are, what you have, and we can provide you with the best price. Um, Zane said, uh, thanks, which is good. <laughs> and um, Constantine Bykov, um, I hope I uh, pronounced that correctly. Forgive me if I haven't. He says, uh, can Velocity help in the case of a poor execution plan? Yes, yes, it can. If you've got, for example, um, badly scripted SQL queries or maybe your SQL databases aren't perhaps optimized or architected in quite the right way, and these situations are generating a lot of, of excess unnecessary storage traffic. Just the ability to reduce that amount of storage traffic that the, sto the slower backend storage has to deal with by, on average, 30 to 50 percent, and the ability to use that very intelligent RAM caching can really make up quite a bit of the shortfall caused by those not so great or bad implementations of database architecture or database queries. And the great thing is you don't have to um, rework any or recode any of those SQL queries or make any changes to the SQL database architecture. All you need to do is install the software and it will work out of the box to uh, start optimizing those environments. No SQL changes are required at all. Um, no changes to the queries. It will just work. So Yes, to answer that question, in the case of poor, uh, a poor execution plan with SQL or Oracle or ERP environments, BI environments, um, yes, we can absolutely help. But don't take my word for it. Get a hold of the trial web. Try it for yourself and, and prove it. Um, we're very happy to help you with that. Um, just feel free to get in touch. So... I hope this session has been useful. I apologize deeply that I had to re-record this. That was entirely my fault. It was my job as well as to present it to make sure that I hit that record button and I, <laughs> I neglected to do that. So I hope this recording goes some way to making up for that. Um, wish you all the best and look forward to uh, hearing from some of you. Take care. Try the trial web. Use that link. Thanks, everyone. Have a very good rest of day. Take care.